Hi, everyone. I'm happy to virtually welcome you all to today's Ad Art Show 2020 Lunchtime POV from MVBO Art. My name is Emily Anastasi from the MVBO Art team, and it's my pleasure to welcome Ben D. Bennett, Principal of Aerialist and co-founder of 600 and Rising, for his series titled Creative Ambassadors in the Ad Industry, featuring Mike Tong, founder of the Culture LP and strategy director of Giant Spoon, and Michael Liu, founder of Slim Cinema. Welcome, everyone. Let's get started. Thank you for these wonderful intros throughout the month, Emily. Uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and it's a pleasure to see uh, this really great virtual audience uh, this morning. I've got a, another couple of really dope creative ambassadors uh, of, of the arts who also happen to work in advertising. Uh, so we, we've got, uh, you know, I'm Bennett Bennett, and we've got Mike and Mike. Uh, so we'd love for both of you, uh, both of you guys, uh, I've known, I've known y'all for, for a bit. You've been building these really awesome experiences and, uh, you know, movements that embolden, uh, the art community, uh, you know, uh, and I'd love for you both to, you know, introduce yourselves, your day jobs and, uh, you know, uh, the other, the other stuff that you do, uh, between the culture LP and slim cinema. So, uh, uh, Mike Lou, you can go first. Cool. Well, thanks for having us. Um, it's been cool to have, you know, all of us kind of reconnect over this. So this should be pretty fun. Um, so day job wise, I work at Kara media. I don't know if anybody here has worked with Kara, um, previously, but VP director of strategy, innovation and mobile, uh, there. So been at Kara for I think I'm a life for around like eight to nine years now, and, uh, been any, anywhere from comms planning to mobile to tech innovation now strategy so um, been pretty fun um great ride so far and uh on the side uh, founded slim cinema with some friends uh, which mike actually mike tong was there since the beginning as well uh, but slim cinema is a production company as well as a film festival that is based off of the new mobile world of uh, people just being on their phones all the time and so we kind of just reimagine what what film would be like if it was consumed on a phone instead of uh, a big screen or a tv or anything like that and this was probably five years ago before you know, a lot of different uh, platforms were emerging, mobile behaviors were really shifting at that point. So it really started as a hypothesis for us to understand how does the art change? How does people's consumption or uh, viewing of film change if, if, if the screen changed, the behavior changed? And so we started this platform and done some pretty fun projects along the way. So yeah mike is very humble um <laughs> they uh yeah they did that we did that before igtv or any of that stuff um ton of foresight from this man um as ben had mentioned i'm the founder of the culture lp and i'm also a strategy director at giant spoon so from a day job perspective um focused on pretty much like brand innovation and cultural marketing uh initiatives uh, i've been back and forth with giant spoon for a little bit now i me and Mike used to work together at Kara, um, but I, I left for Giant Spoon, then left for the Brooklyn Museum for a couple of years, um, and then now back at Giant Spoon, um, doing some, like I said, brand strategy work, partnership strategy work, um, which has been really great. And it's great to see how much they've grown too. As I was there, I was like employee number eight or nine in New York. And I think we got like a hundred on each coast now, um, give or take. So uh, that's been pretty amazing. But uh, my side hustle, which is which is not a side anything, but the Culture LP has been in the works since 2012. Um, we're a community and consultancy dedicated to empowering black and brown artists and beautifying spaces. So that could be, you know, uh, working with artists like Amani Shankton Roberts, Patrick Eugene, or Ronald Draper on their exhibitions and their marketing strategies for those, or, um, you know, curating a public mural exhibit, uh, which we just did in East New York, or doing consulting for cultural institutions to help them reach diverse audiences. So. It's been amazing to see it grow from a WordPress in my dorm room to like the stuff we've been able to work on now. So it's been great. But uh, yeah, Bennett, Bennett was around. I've known Bennett since high school and Mike was like my first media mentor. So this is full circle thing right here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, uh, this feels like a real special moment right here, uh, getting you guys uh, on this, on this uh, interview stage. So, I mean, you guys and I'm sure uh, you, you've probably gotten yourselves a little bit more familiar with the ad art show. Uh, you know, most of the, the artists that present their work on the Oculus display at, uh, at the Westfield uh, by World Trade Center, they work in advertising. 
you know, you, you guys work in advertising, you are very embedded in the art and culture scene. So uh, I, I would love to, you know, for people to kind of understand that, that sort of work life uh, harmony that, uh, you know, for, for both, you know, from both of your perspectives. I mean, like the harmony between the uh, ad world and, and the art world, so yeah. to speak? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, where to start? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, Mike, if you have anything, I have a couple of things I'd like to share, but if you have something, I, I want to give you the go ahead. We're not in a real room, so I can't read your body language. No, no, go ahead first. <laughs> and I'll um, for me, the synergies are like from the genesis. You know, I've, I, it's taken me a while to realize, but you know, my mother's a graphic designer, self-employed. Right. My father, uh, God rest his soul, was an artist, but also, you know, designed some of the first hip hop flyers. This is some of his work behind me. Um, and just that concept, right? Like advertising inherently is about communication and communicating and storytelling. And that's what art is. Right. So it's like the two have been the two, I think, are, are way closer linked than we allow them to be now because of capitalism and how it works. But I think in terms of my own life, it's been beautiful to see um, just some of the aesthetics that some of these brands have taken on and how how they they speak to like visual artists and and what those needs are and you see it whether it's through like sponsored mural projects or you know art, art programming initiatives um but i do think that advertising is kind of swinging back to being more of an art form right like with this whole data boom there was a real focus on science and programmatic and, and all of these things which are still important when you're talking about business but in terms of the art of it, and you see it with the resurgence of the various civil rights movements and, and feminist movements, that people just want to be heard and, and have their stories be told and, and be equitable in those stories. So it's it's been interesting to to see that reckoning start to start to happen as well. Um, but yeah, for me, I was just thinking about how they're they're intrinsically linked. Just like art, that's what got me into advertising. Now that I think about it, right? It's like I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to, you know. Um, reach people and communicate with different people. And I think art is the, 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 the truth of that. Yeah, I think that's super well said. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't come from like an artistic household. My mom is actually a really great drawer, but like that was never really one of our, our big things growing up. But I, I agree. I think when art, when advertising is effective, it's, it's, it's through the art, right? And I think when art is designed to become some sort of elicit of emotional response, that's what's really we push you know for brands especially if, if if everything's a commodity or if everything is the same then how do you really get somebody to to buy into your brand i think that a lot of it is the emotional piece which you know the the art the films the commercials the design is supposed to elicit some sort of response from you uh when it's done right i think there's the other side of advertising which is more like the, the stuff that mike was talking about the data-driven stuff the the performance media um that was like sort of what I compartmentalized as advertising, just to kind of be top of mind, just be there. But if if advertising is supposed to be driving people towards a brand or to a product and drive an emotional response, it has to be artistic in a sense. And what drives me to these these brands like Nike, you can masters at masters at storytelling, masters at, at, at reading the culture, masters at at hitting home with with people's hearts of understanding what what they need and what what they fight for, and also aligning their values to that. Um, I think that that art and advertising should be intrinsically linked just because um, it really can't go one or the other because you're just throwing stuff in people's faces because the data tells you something. Um, I don't think it's going to be as successful as if you try to like dig deeper into the reason that people are actually um, doing certain things. Great. <clears throat> really, really love those answers, guys. So, you know, you both work for I would consider them more non-traditional agencies. Kara's more like a media agency, and uh, I'm very familiar with uh, Giant Spoon's uh, experiential work over the years, a very big staple at uh, South by Southwest uh, for their work with HBO. So, uh, you know, I think your perspective on these next couple of questions would, would really, really uh, help this audience out. Uh, one, you know, how, how do either of you believe that agencies can best find top creative talent? Don't go to the traditional methods. I got to give it to Kara because working on some initiatives that, you know, might not require college degrees. I mean, that that is the traditional method of go to high school, go to college, graduate, get your internship, and then get hired at the lowest level. You know, our industry is just played with undervalued, people and talent like we, we know this is across the board um and so if you pay an equitable 
rate for people based off their talent, not necessarily their I guess, education limit, which in itself uh, leans towards certain ways. Um, I think you will, you'll start to find more perspectives. And I think that's the key to actually getting more creative work out is having multiple perspectives and surrounding yourself with diverse people, diverse cultures, diverse thoughts, um, diverse skill sets to actually shape the ship going forward. I think when everybody's on that same path and everybody has come up together in the same ranks, um, you know, you get the same sort of uh, output, which um, I think is, is showing now with the, that industry overall of the types of work that's coming out, um, the types of pressure that clients are having, the types of pressure that platforms, tech platforms are building um, consultancies are building, brands themselves are building in-house because agencies right now are going that traditional route and seeing the same results. So I think if we break that mold and actually start to pull people from, you know, from even high school if they want to, or from trade schools or for other things like that are not analogous to even advertising, just different fields that have that different side of thought. Um, you know, one of my favorite companies out there is IDEO and they, they, they sort of do the same thing where they grab different perspectives and different skill sets to design certain things together. So I really admire that about, about that company. Yeah. And I wanted to circle back to something Mike said earlier regarding his mom, right? Like when I mentioned my father, he wasn't a professional artist. He was a janitor, right? Like he was, he had a GED, but the art is MFA level art. So advertisers have to stop. We, I mean, advertisers, corporate America, right? We have to stop using, like Mike said, these credentials are keeping so many people out, people that are creating the culture, people that are shifting how we see the world are, are kept out of the conversation or out of the t off the table, so to speak, because they didn't go to certain schools or they don't have uh, uncles that are CEOs at certain companies, right? So I think just opening your perspective and realizing that what you think is not always right, like you, you, you can take, you have to take a risk. And I think there's also something, there's so many uh, communities, collectives, you know, these groups, these, uh, whether it's like Zeal Press, Black Creatives, my organization, the Culture LP, you know, there's so many organizations that already have existed. And those are younger ones, right? There's so many art collectives that are just making art. They've been making art for years and advertisers, every time we get a pitch, we're like, oh, who should do this? <laughs> who should we work with, right? Like, and then you send an open call on Slack to, you know, your, your strategy group or whoever. And it's like, there are so many people doing this work outside of the walls of your agency. Now those walls are virtual even more easily, you know, to be um, transisted through. So I think people just have to really take risks and, and look elsewhere. And, and like Mike said, not consider the credentials as much. Yeah. Also building on that, I think we've seen a huge wave of um, brands attempting to do certain things like that by for different campaigns, reaching out to creators. I think creator culture has been uh, pretty prevalent in the past few years where brands are realizing that like it's, it's not in, it's not in house all the time. Um, so they have to find these communities like the culture LP who know their specific audience and know how to do it in the, in the most authentic way. Um, and so they'll find people who are artists, they'll find designers, they'll find videographers and, um, They'll help them tell the story through their eyes versus just using that talent and calling it their own. Because I think that's where the industry was before. And so it's, it's more of now how do we show the artist as a face of the brand as well. And so I think that's been pretty monumental for the shift of advertising in the past probably three to four years where these creators have had more of a voice than they had before where they're more behind the scenes. Absolutely. I think, I think the next step for that will be, um, you know, almost like these in-house A&R kind of groups in a way, right? Like where, like, cause instead of it being this one-off, like, oh, okay, we found this dope creator, they're going to be an influencer for our campaign. They'll also like make up a, a piece of merch for this brand. And then, you know, we'll see you next brief. Um, how do, how do we get to a place where it's economically feasible to have, you know, someone in-house that keeps those relationships warm, or you have some sort of social component where, you're able to, to really incubate with, with these creative talents so that it's not a one-off thing or, you know, ad hoc kind of request, but, you know, it's a real relationship. And I think that's where we'll really start to see shifts um, in the industry too. Back to Mike's point. Like we've seen the shift, but now how do we sustain that shift, right? And how do we make sure equity is a part of that? Um, so that's not just these one-off things um, that have pop up. And I, I think, again, just seeing how teams operate um, again across the industry it's not even just from my own experience but there's people making decisions for brands that aren't actually part of the culture that the franchise attach themselves to and that's a problem number one of how do you have that voice of um and i hate this word of buzzwords of authenticity but it's so important to really be 
be real with sort of how you're approaching things because you should have people that are part of the team that actually understand the culture that they're trying to reach out to. And oftentimes if you have, as Mike was saying, that ambassador just to kind of keep their hands on the pulse, that should be a real role. And I don't think that that's necessarily a, a typical or um, a common role around media agencies or even creative agencies, you know, maybe, maybe experience, not even experiential probably, but um, social agencies probably. But I think that's something that should be a little bit more prevalent and, and more common just because they're so important to have boots on the ground and understand how things move and how things shift and who, who's moving what. And I, and I think that's um, something that should probably pop up in the next couple of years. Yeah. I feel like uh, one, one, you know, this, this, I love the back and forth uh, between you guys because it kind of blended into uh, one or two of the next uh, couple of questions. Uh, you know, one, and I, I kind of want to dig into uh, your thought on A&R type uh, roles within the agency world, because it, it goes well with this question of how do agencies build better environments for creativity? You know, so uh, I love this authenticity stuff. I, I love this a and stuff. So, you know, I'm going to let you both uh, kind of have the floor here. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously with COVID in mind, like everything is different, right? But I, I do think there's something to physical interaction and space um, and, and building community. Um, I also think that it's, it's, it's going to take a big shift in terms of how agencies are financed to do it the right way, right? Because... <laughs> you're not really going to find many fortune 100 clients that want to pay for somebody to like just float around. <laughs> and that's why you always find it being like external consultants. But to Mike's point, you need people who have like an A&R in traditional sense, they were from a music standpoint, like they were at shows, they were at emerging shows, they're at, you know, so from a visual art, they'd be the ones at galleries doing studio visits, like a curator in a sense, right? Like they're on the ground. But if you're, if you're in an office 40 to 70 hours a week, you're not moving the culture. You're, pushing paper, right? Like it's okay but it, it, to accept that truth. But um, I think to have like an A&R role in place, you'd have to have like a really, um, just thinking as like, if you were an agency owner, you'd have to have a really, I think there's two ways. You'd have to have a really um, like a innovative client that'd be willing to fund a, 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 pro a project or SOW that has that kind of built in, you know, where you're selling through an individual, like, hey, this person has done this. We want to bring them on as your eyes and ears to culture that'll partner with our strategist. Or you partner with an organization like like ours where it's like okay we have these touch points whether it's like quarterly work sessions you know or something like that where you're bringing us up to speed on on what's happening in the world um but i feel like that's that's the way it's gonna have to be really non-traditional for it to be effective um and it's a risk like i said financially it's a risk because the way agencies are funded right now doesn't support that that free work that free time yeah and i think that's just a call for um how business as usual should be disrupting I think that's anywhere from staffing, as Mike is, is mentioning, to, to the mentality of risk and reward and compensation for even the client side. Um, a lot of them are actually afraid, not afraid, or just hesitant in general to, to take those risks or to do certain things that might lower the KPI that they're used to, to receiving or being judged upon. And so that trickles down. You know, they're, they're career people and they've got families and they, they want to make sure that they get their bonus to provide. But... Um, at the same time, it starts at the culture of the, of the leadership to say, hey, look, we want you to be able to take these risks. We want you to be able to have this wacky idea of having like an internal A&R person who, who just has culture, um, have their ear to the culture and just understand how our audience behave and how um, art can actually affect that. And how does, how does our audience um, you know, react to art and what kind of art and who are they following and who are they into? And how do we as a brand partner with that to make sure that we're doing the right thing with the artist um, that also benefits our consumers. And so um, top down, it has to have some sort of uh, support on structural change yeah. and goals. And I do think there are baby steps that could be taken, right? Like whether that's having, um, you know, like the same way we'll have a, a stretch hour or like a meditation hour as an agency or something to that effect. You know, how do you bring in artists to just talk about their practice and compensate them for their time? Not, not you know, it just doesn't have to be... Um, astronomical is an hour discussion obviously they're, they're going to prep you want to compensate them for their prep time um etc but just having more open discussion with artists and agency folks i think is, is really necessary because a lot of times as you saw with like 
the Chantel Martin fiasco uh, that that popped up, right? Like they don't hear from y'all until <laughs> it's time to like produce something. And that's not how artists work. If you've ever shadowed an artist or collaborated with a real visual artist that they, they don't care about your fiscal calendar. <laughs> they don't care about that. They, they're making art from their spirit. So you should be having conversations with them on an ongoing basis as, as much as that relationship will allow. Yeah, I mean, there's so many artists or, or creators, um, you know, directors, filmmakers, everything like that, who will come up with a treatment and have a whole concept and pitch it and then like no dice or no, no word has been said back for like months. And the amount of money and time and just sort of like the cost benefit of them, you know, turning down other gigs because they think this is a brand that's gonna like really set me off, yeah. you know, and then there's no compensation. They, they feel so salty. So for the for the brand to not understand how that culture, or that community works, um, is very difficult. And you and you know, hearing from other folks who get paid for the development of these ideas, they absolutely love the brand. They love working with it. They they're they're advocates of saying they really understand how to work within creative communities because they pay you for your thoughts. They pay you for your time. Right. And that's really what, what creatives are. It's not just the output. It's the time that comes into prep. It's, it's looking at references. It's inspiration. It's everything like that. Even just come up with like a storyboard or a treatment or some sort of like little um, deck pitch. It, there's a lot of work that, that's the 80-20 behind it. So, and Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of curious. A thought uh, crossed, my, uh, crossed my mind. Like, you know, how early would you want to get an artist, uh, you know, if, if you want to collaborate with them, you know, if they, if they feel like the perfect fit for a brand for like new business, right? Like, would you bring them in for the pitch? You know, would you bring them as early in as early as that and just have them like understand what the brand is about and then, you know, have them riff on some ideas with the creative team or in an ideal world, I mean, <laughs> like, I don't know, it's tough, right? Because it, the, one, it just depends so much on the medium of the creator, right? Like, are they a photographer? Are they a sculptor? Are they an oil painter? Are they an acrylic painter? Are they a collage artist? Are they a digital collage artist? Like, what do they do? And that definitely affects, and what do they do? What could they do for this project? Because a lot of times those people do all those things, right? So it's also, it's also just like super nuanced in that way. I think it has to be as far upstream as possible. Like I think agencies should be collaborating with artists and paying them for their time before they even have that pitch, which is why I say the financing aspect is tough, right? Because even a lot of these agency pitches, the new business is a lost leader. Like they're pitching, they're flying people and pre COVID flying people out, building pitch decks, you know, like that all that time sunk into pitches is free. So to also add another line item to pay an artist is tough, but it's like, how do you, how do you have like work sessions that happen, like I said, on a regular basis where maybe it's a little bit more general, like, oh, we've had clients ask for these sorts of things. What would you do and pay them for that? So then when it does hit, it's not starting from scratch, you know, because um, the idea of co-creation, it, it means they actually have to be truly a part of, of the build out. You don't want to come to them with a mood board. Like uh, so many times you see like artists will receive like a mood board and outputs and and then they, they then start from scratch again because they're artists. They're not they're not you know, they're not uh, vendors, they're not production partners. So I don't know, I, I would say it would be lovely to be have like several months in advance, but also know that new business pitches come and it's like, it's due next Tuesday. Yeah, <laughs> and it's that's long again. <laughs> you know what I'm my, saying? So. Timeline is crazy. So, I mean, my take would be have parameters, have a brief ready. Um, and it depends, as Mike was saying, how you want to utilize that artist. Is it just for the art or is it for their likeness as well? If they're gonna put their name on it, then they they should be there from ground zero, yeah. um, especially right. They they should understand what the brand is trying to do, and then what they want to do with 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 the artist. But if it's just for um, you know having them be a part of putting their taste on on whatever the campaign is, just give them the brief, give them the parameter that early on, and then work with them as a as a consultant or guidance. I mean, they don't they're and they're not end all be all for it because obviously the brand still has to protect their brand because it's the longevity piece of it, but um, involving the artists at those different key points. So if it's using their likeness or if it's a true collaboration and it's like Chantal Martin is the face of it, then yeah, have her on the very, very start from scratch. But if it's someone to create um, a campaign, then perhaps just give them that, uh, bring them at the brief stage where they can really understand what your, your goals are and the parameters of everything, give them those constraints. Mm. Great, great, great. Problem solvers. I think a lot of times agencies, 
agency folks also pride that we also pride ourselves as problem solvers. So then you go to the artist with the solution, and that's not how the most of them would work. You got to go to them with the problem, you know, and like what you're trying to solve for, or what what is the end goal of this? Like like saying like allowing them to have that that real stake in the game, which costs more time, costs more money. It's it's more risk, but it's it'll have a higher reward. And it, I just quickly I, I wanted to circle back to your point about you know brand managers and you know folks on the age of brand side they are they are being tracked to certain KPIs and culture while it moves rapidly it also takes a long time to see the fruits of it you know what I'm saying it takes like it takes you taking risk on an idea and, and not really having a boom effect and then years later it's like oh yeah you were onto that like even Giant Spoon I remember us working on a future of experiential deck in 2016 and I'm looking at experiential stuff that's happening now because of COVID that was in that deck you know what I'm saying and it's like to take those bets that early on, whether it's with an artist or with an experiential idea, is, it's, it's risky and, and, it, and it may not show you fruits right away for that quarterly bonus that you're hoping for. Yeah, I, I hear that. So I, I, I've got like probably uh, one or two last questions for, for you guys. Uh, given that so many of our, uh, of the Ad Art Show sponsors are more traditional agencies. I, I love a lot of the tactics and a lot of the thoughts. And uh, the, clearly the roster of artists actually work within agencies. So what can agency leaders do to best tap into that internal talent that, you know, if not for uh, a platform like the art show might, you know, never get a chance to, you know, tap into that true artistic side of themselves? Show and tell, show and tell. <laughs> just schedule like a free hour, lunch hours or something, you know, where people can just talk about the shit they're working on, whether it's a new film, a short film, you know, illustration doodles. Like, I don't know, I just, you just need more open time, more sharing time. It's hard virtually, but I think giving, especially younger talent, that chance to talk about something. Cause a lot of times you're like that kid in class that's like doodling in your notebook and the teacher comes around, you close your notebook, right? Like. How do you how do you enable free time to share those doodles and those thoughts that might not be applicable to daily business? I think is on leadership to do. Yeah, I think you know me and Mike actually worked uh, run a group together, a little internal team, um, even at Kara, and the whole premise of it was to bring uh, diverse minds together, and we were some of the more creative folks, uh, you know, I would say. Uh, in the agency who were go-getters and people who were just passionate about something. It could be passionate against like stamp collecting. It, it could be passionate against, you know, building communities, but it was actually just getting everybody in a room to share those skill sets with one another. And um, a lot of beautiful work came out of it and a lot of connections were made out of it. And I think that's the most valuable thing because uh, as people, you know, left, Mike was one of them who actually left um, the agency, but like, you know, I guarantee you this group of people was, was making that decision a lot harder. And we heard that from a lot of folks. It's just that, you know, when you have a group of community of like-minded people who, who can vibe off one another and build and sharpen each other, that's something that, that makes the culture of the agency that much more uh, irresistible and sticky. I think when you're saying, how do you, how do you draw out some of that creativity from the, from the agency talent? It's giving them the opportunity. I think, you know, a, a great thing, um, you know, that I've seen agencies doing as well as the one that I work at is they support these things. They, they support these endeavors. They, they understand that, the best talent out there is actually people who actually have side hustles or, or have side interests. It doesn't have to be a hustle. It could be a side interest. You know, somebody who's not afraid to actually show those things. And that talent builds, you know, um, you know, monumentally and incrementally around the people that they're around because they show that they're passionate about certain things and they draw from those inspirations. So when you, when you can have lateral thinking and say, Hey, I'm into, you know, film or I'm into cinema or I'm into, um, you know, photography or design, you can pull those elements into your work and that makes your work even that much better. And so I think creating that safe space where it's not, you know, chastised to have a side hustle or chastised or, or punishable to have some sort of um, side thing, whether you're a DJ or anything like that. Um, and that you feel supported along those lines. That's what, when people feel comfortable kind of bring that out and be proud of, Hey, this is what I'm doing outside of work. I don't have to hide it. You know? So I think that's a really good thing to, to spur create creative talent internally as well. Any, any additional thoughts, Mike? Um, no, I was just thinking about, yeah, the uh, reinvention of that group and being able to, you know, like on a Friday afternoon, just share, what are you reading? What are you working on? What have you seen in culture? And it was with Giant Spoon having the, um, the culture fund. Like I was able to, when I first got to the agency um, the first time, you know, uh, 
travel to the LA office, go to design week, go to the BT awards, uh, like ch ch uh, events that were happening in parallel, and then like make a deck and report back to the agency on what I found, what I thought was interesting, like that kind of stuff. Um, one, it's like a great tool of perspective, right? Like I think a lot of our ideas come from like hearing new things, right? Hearing from people that you've never seen before. But then too, it also lets me talk about like the friends I saw in LA that do other cool things, right? And that, 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 that can either open a door for a project or just like you said, inspiration or just, you know, facilitating that creativity and that environment. Of um, yeah. yeah, that's dope, man. Like when I heard that you had that culture fund where you, they give you a stipend to go to Com, um, you know, conferences. conferences or anything like that and report yeah. back. That's, that's so smart just to feed culture into the agency and, and feed uh, very many like perspectives and things that, again, like you were saying that you're, you're nine to five behind a computer screen all the time. Um, so how do you actually instill that? You, anything outside of work is on your, is on your time, right? Like right. if you're going to say, you know, oh yeah, I, I like to stay tapped in. Well, the agency is going to like expect that out of you, but you know, you're not paying someone extra to be tapped into certain certain things. So I think having that fund allows them to feel like they're not going on their own dime or their own time to help feed the agency if they're not being compensated. So that's a really smart idea from them. And we did do field trips at the Brooklyn Museum with the marketing team. We would go to like other museums together. We would, you know, we would, if there was like a new show that came out, we'd go try to see that show together. Just because we found, I found too that like, working at a museum, I stopped going to museums because <laughs> it was similar. It's like, you're not getting paid to go to these shows and it ends up like feeling like work. So how do you kind of build that time out? Obviously blocking the calendar out as far in advance as possible so it doesn't get booked with meetings, but you know, those sorts of things, just getting out into the world together is important. That's great, that's great. So, you know, I, I want you guys to, to plug yourselves and the work that y'all are doing. So, you know, are there any updates from the Culture LP? Are there any updates from Slim Cinema? Um, yeah, uh, check out Gates of Atlantic. Um, we just curated, shout out to Sierra Britain and the uh, LDC of East New York um, and the Small Business Services Department in New York City. We just curated uh, 13 roll down gates with, I believe, eight, eight artists, black and brown artists in East New York, Brooklyn. Um, if you go to gatesofatlantic.com, you'll find the Google map of all the, of the murals. They're public, they're up, and um, they speak from everything in the Black Lives Matter movement to autism awareness. Um, and just there's like a beautiful mural that um, Egypt did of uh, Kiana and George Floyd, um, George Floyd and his daughter Kiana, as well as Kobe and his daughter Gianna. Um, that's up and, and it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. But check us out on Instagram at the Culture LP. And if you're looking to reach diverse audiences, you know, you can find us there as well. We, we do consulting as well. So that's what I'll plug. Uh, for Slim, we are, you know, given its production and the COVID stuff happened and uh, we're also a physical event. It, it made things a little bit difficult for us. So we're still kind of sitting back, waiting to figure out what's going to happen from from a uh, experiential type of thing. But we're also looking at how do we as a company and a platform uh, for filmmakers and diverse filmmakers um, have their voice and, and be, be heard and show their vision and the perspective. So uh, Slim Cinema, follow us at Instagram at Slim Cinema. Shout out to my team, uh, Mark Coors, Brian Ryan, and, um, you know, we're, we're working on some stuff right now, but hopefully when, when quarantine ends um, and, you know, the world gets better, uh, we'll be able to come back together and, and provide another experience together, uh, whether it's like a drive-in or anything like that. But we, we definitely want to continue to be that platform for, for diverse and uh, independent creators to, to show their work and share their vision. So uh, check us out at Slim Cinema. And uh, thank, thank both of you guys for, for having time, especially you, Mike, on the West Coast. I know uh, it's still morning over there, uh, but I appreciate you having this uh, mini re reunion with me. And, uh, you know, uh, we look forward to, uh, no, you know, engaging more with uh, both of your audiences. And I hope you get a chance to check out a lot of the work from uh, the Ad Art Show. Uh, so uh, for everybody watching, thank you again for... Uh, for being part of this Lunchtime POV series. Uh, tomorrow, you've got Alexis Hyde and Erica Wong from To Practice and Practice, uh, you know, just uh, educating people on how to how to survive a as an artist, you know, the, the business aspects of the, of the game. So uh, make sure you tune in for them, uh, 1230, and you'll catch me again next, uh, next Tuesday, next Tuesday afternoon. So we'll all talk soon. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Bennett, Michael, and Michael for today's great conversation. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in to today's live stream. 
All POV interviews will be available for viewing on mvvr.com and on MVVR's YouTube channel. We encourage you all to tune in tomorrow for the next weekly live POV hosted by Dr. Erica Wong of To Practice Practice and Alexis Hyde of Softcore LA, titled Opportunities, Where Are They? I encourage everyone to check out our fundraiser on Custom Inc. and buy a branded t-shirt to support City Harvest during Hunger Action Month. And I also encourage everyone to visit the Oculus at the West World Trade Center and see the Ad Art Show 2020 come to life on the screens. Make sure you stop at Italy for a free coffee and dessert. Thank you all and we'll see you tomorrow.